Hello, um, my name is John Hawley. I'm a open source developer at VMware, and today I'm going to be doing an introduction to NF tables. This is this was originally intended as a, a, a workshop. Um, I'm basically uh, uh, due to everything not going to be able to do that. Um, so what I'm going to be doing today is talking about a bit of the history, a bit of um, how NF tables came about, what how it works, how IP tables works, uh, um, how IP6 tables works, how basically X tables works, and kind of go into a couple of brief examples that you should be able to copy um, once you've got uh, the slides. So um, without too much further ado, uh, um, let's kind of change this up a little bit. Again, um, I'm John Hawley. I'm uh, uh, an open source developer at VMware. Um, if you're interested in getting a hold of me, um, the you know the the easiest way uh, uh, track me down on uh, IRC and Warthog Nine. Um, if you need to tweet at me at Warty Nine um, or e Warthog Nine will get to me, but I'll respond on at Warty Nine. Um, should be pretty easy to track down. My email is uh, pretty easily found. So if you've got any questions, comments, go ahead and uh, uh, toss them out there. Um, Quick uh, uh, aside, uh, uh, the content in the, this particular talk is CC by SA 4.0. Um, if you're interested in recycling it, using it, please, by all means, go ahead. Just follow the, the CC by SA. So without uh, um, digging in uh, uh, too far, we're basically pa talking about packet filtering today. So uh, there, there's um, a lot of really good ways to try and protect your computer. and. Um, the easiest way is obviously to take your computer, uh, um, encase it in cement, and drop it into the Marianas Trench. Now, the downside to this particular security methodology is that you can't actually use the computer and you're also dumping a lot of things into the Marianas Trench. It's very secure, though, uh, at least until we can you know, bring things up from the Marianas Trench and then you're kind of uh, um, uh, 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 kind of doomed at that point. But Obviously, you know, we want to hook computers up to the internet. We want to be able to do things uh, um, with our computers um, on a network uh, uh, scale. So the obvious thing is, is we hook them up and, well, as much as we would like to believe that the internet is a wonderful and glorious and happy place to, to be connected to, it's not. It's actually, you know, full of script kitties. It's full of all kinds of uh, uh, entities that are attempting to, to gain control over um, computers for their own needs, their own wants. Um, their own nefarious purposes, uh, uh, potentially. So um, th th this is something that we need at least a, a first line of defense in trying to secure things. And the obvious way we can go about doing this is to use a, a network packet f uh, uh, filter system. And this is built into the operating system. This is actually, in most cases, uh, uh, built uh, right into the, the network stack itself um, because it needs to kind of be that close to, to the rest of the network stack. And, uh, um, you know, th this allows you to at least try and stop the vast majority of the basic uh, um, situations you're going to run into. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be um, a, a panacea for everything, but at least it will give you that first line of defense that you can use to, to protect yourself. Um, and specifically what this is going to do is it's going to mostly just drop traffic that it has a rule defined that it shouldn't be accepting. Um, it, it is really nothing more complicated than that. There's a series of rules. It de uh, decides uh, against the rules whether it should accept something or drop something. Um, there's also, when we kind of get down in into this a little bit more, there's state list fire uh, uh, filtering systems and there's state full filtering systems. We'll get into this a little bit later. But it's kind of the difference between, uh, um, you know, blindly just reading whatever is there or trying to do a, a bit more intelligent uh, uh, taking a look at what's going on. So, there we go. Um, packet filters. So, packets have a lot of, of pieces of information stuffed into them outside of the piece of data. Um, and when a lot of us think about, you know, when we open up HTTP colon slash slash Linux dash foundation dot org, um, really what we, we tend to think about is that this does some sort of a DNS query. It looks up an IP address and it just sends the entire packet out and gets a bunch of data back. Uh, um, conceptually, this is the, the, the way it works because HTTP uses TCP. So we can kind of, 
you know, at least from the application perspective, treat this entire connection as a, a, a one in, one out, and um, everything's done. Except that's not actually the way that packets transmit on the wire. In fact, they get broken up into uh, um, logical chunks uh, um, of about, uh, most of the time on the public internet, it's about 1,500, uh, um, uh, and using an MTU of about 1,500. A little bit hand wavy because of a, a variety of things. Not going to necessarily get into it, but um, the data packet is not uh, the, the data portion of that is not the only thing that that gets transmitted on each one of these uh, uh, chunks of data. In fact, there's an entire header section that has a bunch of useful pieces, particularly for our purposes, for doing uh, uh, filtering. There's an IP address, whether that's um, IPv4 or IPv6. There's a protocol uh, um, uh, defined in the header to give you an idea of what type of packet this is, whether it's TCP, UDP, uh, you know, great many other th uh, um, things that it could be, TCP and UDP obviously being the, the most common these days. Um, the type of service. Most of the time you don't need to worry about that, but you know, it's in the header. Um, the hardware interface that it came from or, or that it's going to. Um, the direction that the packet's going, uh, um, et cetera. The, these are, our, you know, there's a, a, a number of pieces of um, information that's encapsulated in that header. Although, for the most part, the IP addresses, both the source and destination, um, the port that's being used, and a few other uh, uh, bits and pieces of information there are, are really what we care about from a, a filtering perspective. Um, and, and, in, and in a stateless system, again, stateless, nothing's being recorded on uh, or tracked on the uh, um, firewall side uh, um, so that it can actually do more logical things. It's really just looking at each individual packet as an entity unto itself and making all of its decisions um, based on that specific packet. A stateful uh, uh, firewall will, however, um, build a much larger piece of, uh, of the puzzle, a much larger piece of the, the picture to actually make its uh, uh, determination on what's going on with the um, specific uh, uh, stream. Now, from a stateless perspective, you have little visibility into the, the packet payload. And, and in fact, even from a, a stateful perspective, you really don't have a lot of information on what's going on in the data section of the header. This is intentional because deep packet inspection, trying to actually uh, um, uh, uh, unwind what's going on in that data packet requires a lot of processing. And that's because you, you basically have to reassemble the entire uh, uh, piece that was requ requested and then analyze what's going on with it. Um, and this, this really is just expensive both from a, a memory perspective, a CPU perspective, and um, a, from a latency perspective because th this clogs things up a, a, a lot. There are really useful things you can do from a deep packet inspection perspective though However, it is just very costly and it's not uh, um, probably what you're going to want to do when you do a, a, a firewall. Rhyme and reason why you may or may not care about that, not going to get into that here uh, beyond that. But uh, um, packet filters can also look into the TCP headers. The, what, uh, what we're talking about right now is just the packet. So the, uh, I had mentioned the port. The port's not actually included in the packet header because the packet doesn't need to care about a port. That's a TCP or UDP problem. That's something specific to um, a, a, a different layer of the protocol. But the packet filters can look into TCP adders um, uh, uh, for, for additional pieces of information that may or may not be useful. So, now that I've kind of mentioned ports, let's talk briefly about ports. Ports are, are used in TCP and UDP to define where, a, uh, where a, a, a network socket is coming from and where a network socket is going to. So again, using the example of opening up an, a, a website, basically your computer has a, 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 about 65,535 ports associated to it. This is de uh, um, basically defined from TCP and UDP. And there, there's two ways you, you, you can use these sockets. M most of the time you're gonna wanna use these when you bind. You bind to a, a specific socket or a specific port so that you can listen on it. Now, this this is great for listening when you're uh, uh, talking out. A lot of the time you also want to listen, so you end up uh, also kind of associating yourself to that port when you talk out. Um, and uh, 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 when you're binding to a port and you're listening, you usually bind to a very specific port. You're very well, it, it's usually a well-known port. 
um, that others know how to talk to. So, case in point, FTP uses port 20 and 21. NTP uh, um, uses 119. Um, SMTP uses port 25, Telnet 23. Um, our, our example of HTTP uses port 80. For HTTPS, it uses 443. Um, these are these are ports that should be relatively uh, um, well known to you. If they're not, it's worth taking a look at what ports are actually running on your system. You can do this with you know things like Netstat, or even just taking a look at, at a TCP dump um, of what's going on in your system. Or you know, d only doing this against systems you control or that you have permission to do this against. Nmap is a, a really great way to also double check what ports are open, what ports are listening um, on your system. It's not going to tell you what's going out. Netstat will tell you both incoming and outgoing, but Nmap will be able to to tell you what's going on, uh, what's listening on your on your system. Um, and some ports have very specific meanings. So you know things like FTP port 20 and 21. These uh, 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 port 20 and 21 have been uh, uh, kind of assigned to FTP. Everybody probably knows that FTP is running on those. You don't necessarily have to have FTP running on those, but most people are going to expect. Um, FTP to be running on those. Same things with something like uh, HTTP. Um, everybody expects it to be running on port 80. However, if you've got a, an IoT device or something around in your house or you know, you've been doing some web development, a lot of people will, for development purposes, run a, a server on port 8000 or 8080 or something like that that they can still get to. The port is just a, a it's um, if you want to think about it as an apartment complex, you have a full address. That's what the IP address is. The port is just what apartment in that address uh, uh, you would like to, to communicate with. So um, there are also some very specific uh, um, ports uh, that require special permissions. So on a lot of operating systems, port 1 through 1023 um, are considered service ports or uh, um, super user require or permissions required to use that port. So things like port 80, you actually have to be a super user to use. Um, this is both good and bad. Obviously, you don't necessarily want, you know, a, a random user to be able to attach to these ports because lots of important things do run on these ports. Um, on the flip side, you also don't want a web server running as root. This is a bad idea. Um, so what a lot of the these um, uh, service daemons that do attach to the these lower level ports, what they do is they they open the port as a root or, or as a super user privilege root whatnot, and then once they've uh, acquired uh, uh, the address, the listening space, they actually switch to a different uh, uh, user uh, um, to actually do the rest of their their running. So um, that's kind of how some of these things work. Unfortunately, some of these things do just straight up run as root. This is not a great idea. Some of these things need to be fixed. A lot of this is open source. Obviously, patch is welcome. Um, but obviously, I, I've said there's 65,535. I've only talked about about 1,000 of these. What are the rest of these ports used for? Well, a lot of things. Um, generally speaking, there are uh, uh, ports 1024 through about 50,000. It's 4, uh, 49,151 on most operating systems, are reserved for uh, um, services that run not as a super user. So, you know, things like NFS or NF, uh, uh, SVN or OpenVPN, they don't necessarily need to be in the, this, you know, hyper-privileged uh, uh, run level, but they do need a port to be able to communicate with. So most operating systems generally re reserve um, that space for those ports. So things like, you know, eight, port 8000. I, as a normal user, I don't need to be a super user. I can I can bind to port 8000 and do things with it. Well, again, we're only up to about 50,000 uh, out of the 65,000 ports. So what are the last few ports generally used for? Well, the last uh, um, uh, range of ports, 40, uh, about 49,152 to about 65,535, are used for the outgoing connections from your system. So when you open that socket, you want to talk to a server that, that is on port 80 on the remote side, but you need a, a, a port on your side to, for the communication to actually work. And so what the, your operating system will do is when you go to open that socket, it will actually assign you a, a, a port that you are communicating on, and that comes out of the 49,152 to 65,535 range. 
Most Linux kernels actually limit this uh, um, a, a little bit differently. They're down into the 32,768 up to 61,000 uh, um, for those sockets. There's rhyme and reason why why this is broken up a little bit differently, but they're still ephemeral ports. They're not intended for you to bind a service to that you will then connect to. Although in some cases you can, generally it's still not a great idea because the operating system doesn't like having those ports kind of taken away from it. So these are ports. Now, we can get into some interesting problems with just port blocking. And port blocking is very, very useful. Don't get uh, um, let this slide uh, um, deter you from using port blocking. It is very, very powerful. And in most cases, it's probably what you're actually going to want to be doing, either explicitly opening up ports or specifically closing ports uh, um, that, are a that have access to your system. However, sometimes this gets weird. Let's take FTP, for example. FTP is uh, um, an older legacy protocol. Um, if you've never played with it, it's been out there for a long time, um, but it has a really odd way of communicating. In fact, the way it communicates is it actually uses two ports. When you connect to FTP, the client sends arbitrary uh, uh, commands to port 21 on the server. Now, the server sends all of its responses on port 20 to the client. Um, on a dynamically allocated port. So this gets really weird in some very odd ways because one of the first things in the FTP transaction you're going to do is you're going to say, I am, you know, I'm a, a client. I am talking to you obviously at port 21. Please respond to me from your port 20 to this uh, um, uh, uh, other allocated port. Well, this is really weird and this is very odd. And obviously a stateless firewall can't handle this because it's going to see um, a packet going out to port 20 and you, that's probably going to be allowed but when it sees uh, um, the packet come back from port 20 uh, on port 20 it's not going to know that this is the same transaction unless you blindly open up all uh, uh, anybody sending you data from port 20 to any port obviously that's a bad idea so you know th this gets into a really odd uh, um, situation where you do actually need a state full uh, um, piece of the uh, firewall. Usually this is built in as a module into the, um, the the packet filtering system itself so that it actually keeps track of, oh, you wanted to talk to that FTP server um, back on this port. Let me go ahead and do the appropriate magic to allow that to come through without necessarily um, everything opening up in a very odd way. This is pretty cool. Um, and so let's kind of dig into packet filtering rules, since this is where we're, we're kind of going with all of this anyway. So really it comes down to you've got a policy that you want to implement and how the firewall is going to be able to do this. So from a policy perspective, you want no outside web access. Let's say that I'm on a, a guest network and for whatever reason, I want nobody to have access to the, the, the web, although I'm okay with them having access to uh, um, the, the Git protocol over it, its native port. Um, you On the firewall side, you would drop all outgoing packets to any IP address using port 80. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and this kind of, you, you can kind of build these rules into more and more complicated uh, um, rule sets as, as you go, you know, so things like prevent your network from being used in a denial of service attack. You know, drop all ICMP packets going to a broadcast address, i.e. something in the, uh, um, 222.22 space, um, specifically in this case, 255.255, uh, um, uh, um, would actually stop, you know, a broadcast, a, a denial of service attack. Is it a good idea? It's going to depend on your situation, but it may or may not be uh, um, something worth taking a look at. So, and in fact, you can, uh, um, while I've talked about TCP and um, UDP, ICMP is something you can filter on as well. In fact, you can prevent your uh, uh, your entire network from being trace routed. There's rhyme and reason and a lot of uh, argument over whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Even be, uh, um, even if you look at Windows 10, um, and I think uh, some of the other more recent um, uh, uh, versions of Windows, they don't even allow you to ping them, which is a really interesting problem when you want to figure out if the system's up. Kind of hard to tell sometimes. So. Uh, um, these firewalls can be can be very powerful, can be very interesting. 
Um, and when you get into things like uh, um, IPv6, particularly from the ICMP perspective, you can actually break IC, or you can actually break IPv6 by limiting ver uh, a certain ICMP pieces of information from being transmitted, because I uh, IPv6 actually requires certain pieces of um, uh, ICMP to be able to flow back and forth between the, the systems, particularly to, particularly to determine an intermediate MTU that they can both use to communicate more effectively. So, packet rule definitions. Rules are, are processed from top to bottom in almost all packet processing systems. It doesn't matter whether it's Linux or Windows or um, Mac or most operating systems, even you know uh, uh, the big commercial um, hardware vendors for, uh, for for firewalls. They all pretty much go the same way. They, they all process from top to bottom uh, um, until they hit a match. And unless the match specifically says to continue for whatever reason, sometimes they're uh, um, marking a packet for, for later uh, um, investigation or usage or routing um, or whatnot, you know, once you find a rule that matches, that's the end of the story. So um, if you take a look at the um, uh, the example we've got here, which my head is unfortunately cutting off slightly, um, you, you've got a, a deny rule, so anything outside of the 222.22 uh, uh, slash 16 space um, that has a source port greater than 1023 and has a destination port of port 80, all gets denied. So anybody trying to access a web, uh, uh, an HTTP website on this network obviously just uh, uh, gets dropped. However, if you're on the network, if you're, you're on the 222.22, the, the since it's not explicitly denied, you're allowed uh, um, to access that, that port. Um, it, uh, um, the, the next rule, allow outside of 222, go ahead. And if you have a source port, of port 80 and you're trying to, to get to a destination port of, uh, of greater than 1023, you should be fine. I.e., they're basically assuming that a remote web server wants to talk to you on something that's not on a privileged port. Um, this could be for any number of reasons. You know, uh, let's say that a, a web service is attempting to talk to port 8000, i.e., your own uh, portion of a, a web service, and that's what they're trying to do. Um, and basically, like I said, you run through top to bottom, chunk, chunk, chunk. And this last line, that, not that you can read all of it, but it has a, a deny and all uh, uh, in all of the ports across the bottom. And basically what happens is you, you, you chunk, 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 chunk. You figure out if any, uh, anything was denied or allowed. And if you fall through all the way to the bottom, in this case, everything gets denied. So if for whatever reason there was not an explicit rule that allowed or uh, denied you already, your packet was denied. And not, uh, uh, um, and that is just how this particular one is set up. You don't necessarily have to deny everything um, uh, uh, as a, 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 policy, a, a, a policy level decision. A lot of the, the, the times this is just the fall through default of, oh my God, I don't wanna trust anything. Um, so stateless filters, pros and cons. Stateless is actually going to be um, a little bit faster for the most part, just because it doesn't have to look at much uh, as much of the um, the, the stream that's going on, but, it, it, you know, and it's going to be uh, effective against worms and Trojan horses, sort of, um, all, you know, pretty much anything that's a pro or a con is always going to be sort of, because there's always different, there, there's always nuances there that are, that are hard to, to describe or really get into sometimes. Um, it can be very fast at filtering rules that are not too complex, particularly since it's, you know, top to bottom. It's built into the Linux kernel, obvious disadvantages. It's not going to uh, um, stop malformed packets because it's not going to see the, the entire data stream and it's not going to look uh, um, uh, too much further into things like the TCP or UDP uh, um, information. It's not going to protect against protocol-based uh, uh, attacks, buffer overflows, whatnot. It doesn't protect against you know email viruses and it, it's not going to enforce user privileges or, or other pieces along those lines. Um, that's because this is really just a basic you know, first line of defense, it's taking a look and doing some really high level attempts to, to uh, um, take a look at things. Um, so now, that, you know, so let's talk about some stateful filters. You know, I've kind of mentioned things like FTP needs a stateful process to take a look at things, but it, but the, the, the advantage of stateful is it actually remembers the state of the communication session um, taking a look at like the TCP headers and, and whatnot. So if, let's say I open a TCP connection, 
This is a long-lived uh, 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 connection, and it's going to, you know, once it's established, it's not a new connection every time. So you can actually uh, 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 write a firewall that if you have all, uh, an already established connection, um, then you don't need to do any, then this is permitted. Or if you have an already established connection, you know, immediately start denying things because we, we've decided that that IP address is, is bad for whatever reason. Um, and, and, you know, th th there's a, a few extra pieces that you can start taking a look at um, as you, deep, uh, you, you dive into some of this. So uh, a Stateful is actually just keeping track of more information, more about what's going on uh, um, with the connection itself. Obviously, this takes up more RAM. Th th this takes up a little bit more processing time because it's going to look deeper into the packet to, to do things. Um, and and uh, uh, there's some interesting ways of keeping track of what's going on on your system from uh, a perspective, uh, from uh, just from any perspective. Um, I've mentioned things like Netstat. There's obviously uh, uh, things like IPT state if you're using IP tables. Um, but basically, this just gives you a rundown of what's running on your system, both listening and talking. Um, particularly from a uh, um, TCP perspective. Obviously on UDP you can only listen, or you can only list what's being uh, uh, listened on because a UDP packet doesn't keep a, a, a session so you, you wouldn't necessarily know where, you know, who's sending a UDP packet to you if you're just monitoring it kind of this way. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, I, you know, just mentioned, the, the established state. Well, it, you know, the, the system is actually keeping track of whether a packet is new, established, related, invalid, you know, uh, uh, or, or what's going on with that, that packet, with that stream, um, particularly from a TCP perspective. So, it, you know, if it's a new connection, it hasn't quite completed its, its handshake, um, it's still connecting. If it's been established, the, the handshake's complete and data is flowing. If it's related, uh, um, things like that FTP uh, um, example, you, you would see related packets, um, or even an invalid packet. If, somebody, if something's just spewing garbage at, uh, at it, at, at some point the system will recognize that it is invalid and drop it on the floor. Uh, um, certain types of spoofing or certain uh, um, attacks on, uh, on IP blocks uh, sometimes uh, uh, use that attempt to, to break things. Um, and Linux uses the contract mechanism to maintain this connection table. So this is all, like I said, this is all inside the Linux kernel already, whether you're using IB tables or uh, um, NF tables. And stateful filters, pros and cons, advantages, relatively easy to implement from the, the, the user perspective. Not, they're a bit more complicated inside the kernel, obviously. Um, they, they tend to be, they also can be fast, but there's a, uh, they are looking at a lot more pieces, so it kind of depends on what's going on. Um, it does protect against uh, a few additional pieces of um, potential attacks, so you know, bad packets, invalid packets. The, these are things that a stateful firewall can actually pay attention to and keep track of, uh, um, as opposed to a stateless firewall that can't. And uh, um, does not protect against uh, attacks with you know malformed packets. It still doesn't you know protect against email viruses or buffer overflows. That's all left to layers much higher up the stack uh, um, than what we're talking about here. So you're still going to need to run you know you know good code, fix bugs, you know patch CVEs, and you know run things like spam assassin if you're dealing with the email or clam AV if you're dealing with email. Um, so. And to touch briefly on this, um, there are bridges. If you're not familiar with bridges, this is, this is something that's that's worth uh, um, taking a look at because the, these these are used particularly heavily with with virtual machines and um, containers because th these are basically a software switch inside the system that allows you to attach more things to an interface and and just like plugging cables into a physical switch. The really interesting thing, particularly on Linux, is that you can actually filter packets going across this switch. So you can actually set up firewalling rules directly across these bridges, uh, um, uh, you know, in and out and, and doing things there to, to be able to, um, to have a more comprehensive firewall. In fact, NAT actually kind of works this way that um, when it, it Behind the scenes, it's not. It, it doesn't like use bridge utils or anything. But NAT basically sets up this kind of a, a setup inside the kernel to be able to um, uh, filter these things around. 
Um, you can also use the, the, the Brout table where, or where some other pieces of information are, are stored, but I'm not going to get too far uh, um, further down that, that, um, uh, down that rabbit hole, but it's worth being aware that you can filter um, traffic across a, a, a bridge, in, uh, particularly in Linux, and it can be very, very useful. Um, quick overview of net, uh, um, the net filter architecture, which is kind of what we've got. Uh, um, I want to say now, but this is actually in, in the process of changing because um, NF tables is, is becoming more and more wild, uh, widely used. Um, it uses a, a bunch of different separate tables to, to keep track of things. EB tables, ARP tables, IP tables, IP6 tables, and contract. Uh, um, now, the real gotcha um, with all of this is that each one of the, these table implementations, they, they recycle a lot of um, similar ideas. They all kind of do very similar things in slightly different ways. And it, it does end up with a, a you know, very complicated, very interwoven system um, to, to get things through the packet filter. Now, this has obviously all worked for a long time, but there's um, some really interesting and very uh, obnoxious problems with X tables uh, in general, um, even though it has been used since the, the, the 2.4 kernel. Defining both a stateless and stateful firewall rule can be tedious due to the number of rules that need to be written. You basically end up having to write a bunch of different rules across a, a, a bunch of different pieces to actually make a stateless and stateful piece of a firewall work. Um, and it's it, you can't necessarily keep them all in like one file or keep track of them. It's basically keeping track of a bunch of little pieces all completely independently and, and separately. Um, the order of the rules is important, although, like I said, top to bottom uh, um, has always been the way a lot of the, uh, uh, firewalls uh, still process everything. But it's even more important in the way um, these interactions across um, th these tables and these systems all work. So, um, and, and when you're building a multi-tenant, uh, multi-user, multi-tenant server and, and creating and searching these rules can get really, really complicated really, really fast. Um, just because, you know, all of these systems, they all go top to bottom um, trying to, to figure things out. And basically, as you, the number of rules explodes, the search path or the, the, the search path to do everything um, similarly explodes. And probably the most obnoxious thing, particularly uh, nowadays, since IPv6 is finally um, starting to become more and more common, um, IPv4 and IPv6 were, are completely separate firewalls, uh, effectively inside the system. They're not linked in any useful way. So you're actually maintaining, effectively maintaining two firewalls if you've got a, a dual stack system. Um, there's, uh, uh, obviously this is an example of dropping malformed packets. The number of things you need to do to actually figure out that a packet is bad is, you know, uh, um, there's about six commands you have to in enter to get to the point where you've actually determined uh, it inside the, the filter rule that a packet is invalid. Kind of obnoxious. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, Xtables doesn't handle very well by itself is long lists, uh, like I said, is kind of long lists of things. So if you've got uh, um, a block list that you want to to implement directly inside of X tables, you literally have a you know an individual rule for each uh, um, block that you want you want to do. So let's say you have fifteen thousand IPs that you want to block for whatever reason, you would need to have fifteen thousand uh, um, lines of entry. And every packet that comes in is going to be processed against that 15,000 lines each time. Obviously, this is obnoxious. This is not a good thing. Um, there was a tool that, 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 that came out to kind of help solve that, but let, let's get into NF tables because this is um, kind of where NF tables um, starts coming in. So in 2009, the NF tables uh, uh, project was created by Patrick McCarty um, to address a lot of the problems from, from X tables. Obviously, getting um, all of these pieces, all of these networking layers, all kind of cohesively put into a single place, so that you're processing things in one location with one concept, with only, yeah, effectively with only one firewall, um, is super, super powerful and obviously something that needed to happen because, uh, you know, trying to do this any other way is just silly and kind of obnoxious. And... Um, this, uh, uh, this got some really early on traction um, because it did solve a lot of problems and it um, had some really serious advantages versus 
um, uh, uh, IP tables or X tables. Now, what happened was was the IP set command. So I talked about you know if you've got a block list, you've got fifteen thousand items. Well, the IP set came out or our command came out was built um, bundled into the Linux kernel itself, and this gave you a way to do um, a much more efficient, much more uh, um, or much faster. Uh, you know, set of IP addresses or rule sets that uh, um, are all basically identical inside the Linux kernel. And so that 15,000 linear, you know, IP linear search now got turned into something that you could, you know, sh uh, 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 quick sort or quick search uh, um, based on because the, the, the data structures inside the Linux kernel uh, were dramatically better. Um, as a result of th this particular uh, uh, um, uh, feature to address a problem, a really obvious problem in um, IP tables, NF tables ended up getting put on the back burner and uh, um, kind of uh, languished for about four years. It was uh, um, picked back up in 2013 by Pablo, um, and the kernel uh, and the code finally made it into the Linux kernel around 3.13. So, um, Obviously, this is a good thing, and with the explosion of VMs and containers, I mean, you know, I'm sure you can take a look at all the other talks. Probably about half of them, if I had to guess, are, are, are deal with containers or virtual machines in some way. But you know, the, having being able to to make the, the firewall rules much more straightforward, put everything in one place, actually makes dealing with this explosion of additional uh, IP connectivity on your system a lot easier to manage. So. Um, the NF tables architecture, it, it, it more or less just takes a lot of the ideas of X tables and crams them all into a, a, a single location where everything all gets processed as a single bit. Now, one of the really neat things that they're doing with this is they actually take the Berkeley packet uh, uh, filter virtual machine concept. Uh, in fact, it is the, uh, a Berkeley packet filter uh, a virtual machine. And this is what actually does a lot of the filtering. So there's a, a full virtual machine. If you think uh, um, about uh, uh, um, you know, the, these byte compiled languages uh, out there, things uh, um, and, and how you can compile to the, the virtual machine, well, that's basically what you're doing with your firewall now. And what your, your firewall actually is, is this um, byte compiled code running very quickly inside the Linux kernel on top of everything else, which is really, really neat. Um, so, it, it, but by also combining all of this, you no longer need a separate IP tables, a separate IP6 tables, ARP tables, EB tables, etc. It's all in one place. So you don't need to worry a, a, as much about trying to figure out how all of these separate pieces all interact. They're already all there. So you don't need um, uh, 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 no predefined tables uh, um, like input or output or forward. These are already all kind of just built into NF tables. Um, NF table still uses the the hooks for uh, for contract. Um, that hasn't gone away. Um, the system, the, the 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 Linux kernel still obviously needs to, to track connections. This is all hooked in nicely. And one another thing that NF tables really brings to the table is arithmetic um, uh, bitwise comparison operators. So you can actually do fairly complicated firewall rules um, to do uh, uh, certain types of matching. And uh, um, but um, just like X tables, NF tables more or less still uses the same table chain rule tuple set. So you know it should all still look basically familiar, even if the back end. Um, has changed rather dramatically. And, you know, uh, like I said, this is normally done as a, a hands-on tutorial. Um, not going to do that here, but if you want to follow um, some of the things that we've got uh, uh, in the slides here, um, please, by all means, do. Um, I would recommend if you're going to kind of follow some of this, go ahead and do it in a virtual machine. That way you don't screw up your main system. Um, I will not be held responsible for, for screwed up firewalls uh, um, everywhere by doing any of this. But um, obviously th there's a way to, to, to verify NF tables as in your kernel. You can um, check for the, the module being loaded or even if the NFT command is even present. If it's not, obviously, you know, DNF install, yum install, apt-get install, um, NF tables will, will get you the commands and then you can kind of run through and play with some of these. Um, and I'm going to try and make sure that the slides are up somewhere where you can download these because uh, in, a, in a couple of slides there's going to be some really big examples 
Um, they're as short as I could possibly make them, but they're still completely um, in, uh, illegible for the most part. And with the, the video box I've got here, I actually end up, unfortunately, um, covering some of that. So, um, you know, even if you're, you're squinting and reading the, the screen in a pause mode, it's not going to work very well. But um, the, the commands you're really going to, to want to pay attention to if you're going to start playing with uh, um, NF tables is NFT. Um, that's the main command line interface into NF tables. Um, you can also grab the IP tables to NF tables translators and their libraries. I really don't recommend trying to translate IP tables to NF tables. Um, there's a there's so many concepts in IP tables that don't match or that don't map very well um, to NF tables directly, and, and things that you have to work around in IP tables that you don't have to work around in NF tables. That a lot of the translators, particularly for more complicated firewalls, do not handle well. Um, and uh, um, unsurprisingly, with, with anything on, from a firewall perspective on Linux, the firewall that's running in the kernel right now is transient. When you reboot the system, it goes away. You have to fully reload the firewall um, once you reboot the system. Now, most users are, 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 um, aren't going to realize this because there's um, back-end processes, particularly on shutdown, that will save the fire, your current firewall configure, even pre-save it before you shut down. Uh, um, to the, the, the current state and then restore it on the next boot. You know, if you go and you start playing with this directly, be aware that your changes will not will, will not cross a reboot um, unless you specifically save and restore it. Uh, um, and there, there's uh, um, almost every command that you can do with IP tables, you can do with uh, NF tables. In fact, excuse me, um, in more recent kernels, most of IP tables is secretly behind the hood using um, BPF as its um, packet filtering system. So IP tables is actually using the exact same uh, um, packet filtering system in the back end as NF tables. With the, the with the gotcha that you can express things in IP tables and you can express things in IP tables and you can express things in EB tables that do not translate back and forth. So even the translator sometimes will, will translate things to BPF, and since BPF can be um, forward and reversed, we'll try and translate it back to NF tables, and it doesn't work very well at that point. Um, uh, um, and the coexistence of X tables, X tables and NF tables, they hypothetically can. It's just going to confuse you greatly at some point. If you want to start playing with NF tables, just turn IP tables and IP6 tables and basically X tables off you will have a much better experience and it, you, you just won't be tracking down weird and wacky problems as a result. And those are the, the, the pieces of information on how to do that. Um, and the sequence of tasks in, in NF tables is to create a table, then a chain, then a rule. Exactly the same way you would do this with IP tables or IP6 tables. Um, and the address families you're going to want to worry about are IP, which is IPv4, IP6, IPv6, um, INET, both, ARP, bridge, and NetDub. All relatively straightforward. The, these shouldn't be um, too weird on what, what uh, you would expect from a, a firewalling perspective. Um, and another really nice thing that NF tables brings to, to the table is the idea that um, you can use, not only use the command line interface, which is, which is really nice, but you can also save all of this information into a file and then replay that back into NF tables. In fact, the um, if you go to do uh, uh, NFT list rule set, NFT space list space rule set, um, or rules, I don't know, it's built into my fingers. Uh, check the man page if, if I've got it wrong. Um, you can literally just copy and paste what it outputs there, put it in a file, and then uh, um, on your next the next time it would uh, you load your system, you can actually just reload that straight in. It's literally giving you the config file. Um, uh, that it will, will uh, accept. And the, the config files, the files that it can read in, are actually really, really powerful. Um, it, it, as long as you don't flush the rule set somewhere in your, in your file, um, it will actually keep adding whatever is in the file into your existing uh, um, uh, firewall. So if you've got a basic firewall and you just need to be able to add some additional piece, you write up a quick file and then you can import it directly in. Um, it doesn't wipe out your entire existing configuration. That's actually really cool. Um, the other thing that the NFT or the NF tables uh, uh, configuration files can do is they can actually have their own include. So you can actually 
just have, you know, include, 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 include um, to get to a full firewall setup. So these are really worth pointing out. They're really nice to use. I've been using the, the includes and the separate files for a lot of different things, particularly to just separate uh, um, just protocols. So if I want to have a, a, a well-known, well-documented firewall rule for, let's say, SSH, I just put that all into its own configuration file, and then I just include that um, as something into the main, con uh, into the main um, uh, configuration file that, that the system loads. And that's super duper useful. Um, so let's get on to a basic uh, um, firewall setup here. There we go. Um, this is a simple IPv4, IPv6 command, uh, a combined firewall. Um, this is exactly the entire uh, um, uh, uh, rule set that you need to have a very basic, very just, you know, drop everything on the floor if it's incoming or you're, it's attempting to forward or if you're on the, um, or if you're trying to go out, just accept everything. So this is, um, really, really basic, and this does both IPv4 and IPv6 in the same configuration. So you don't even need to think too hard about what's going on here. It all just works. Again, I'm going to have the slides up uh, um, somewhere so you can go ahead and copy and paste and play with this. And if, there, if you can't find it, ping me online. I will get you copies of this. Nothing here is too weird um, for, for, for being able to set stuff up, but at least this gives you a starting point to start taking a look at what do, do these kinds of firewalls actually take a look, uh, or look like? Um, so that's a that's a really that was a really simple firewall, um, you know, something that you would use on like your laptop or an individual machine. Obviously, most of us have a home connection that we would like to NAT. This gives you a really simple, really straightforward uh, um, NAT configuration with the ability to forward a port around um, inside I, inside of the, the NAT. So if you wanted to, to have, let's say, port 1922 actually forward to another SSH-enabled uh, uh, server inside your own network, this has all of the information to do that. Um, this is, I mean, you, this looks like a lot uh, to take in. This is actually really, really short, and most of this is, is basic boilerplate around what's try or what's all happening here. So nothing here is super duper complicated. And in fact, this is this is an example where it actually doesn't include if um, I don't know if any of you will be able to actually notice it, but the first line in this um, on the left hand side is an include statement for another file. That file is the one that's on the right. Um, really simple, really straightforward. Um, um, I don't want to get too far into this because I'm, I'm going to start running out of time and there's a couple of other things I want to touch on before um, I really run out of time. But um, NAT is something I really want to um, have a, a, a brief chat about just because IPv4 and IPv6 are actually rather different beasts for most of us. So in the IPv4 world, particularly like let's just take your, your typical home network, um, you have a single IP address that your ISP gives to you, and all of your machines behind it all go through a network address translation. This all works great. It means that um, the ISP only has to give you one IP address, and NAT, I, won't, I don't want to say that it gives you an extra layer of protection because NAT is not a firewall. It is not protection. There are ways of reversing across a NAT, but it does um, mean that your systems generally are not directly connected to the Internet. Now, that works all well and great, and obviously we all have uh, uh, firewalls for a variety of reasons from that as well, but with respect to IPv6, there is no NAT. And before anybody goes uh, 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 screaming around on, on stuff and tells me that IPv6 NAT does exist, it does, don't use it, it's a bad idea. It, unless you really, really understand it, it's, don't touch it. Um, and pretend that, and absolutely just pretend it doesn't exist. But it does mean that the IP address for your, your system is actually publicly routable across the entire internet. Now, this is going to conceptually be a very big change to how people want to, to deal with their firewalls, how they want to secure things. Um, I mean, ju it, just think about it. You know, right now, if you're on a native network, 
you have this semi-insulation that nobody can ping your IP address directly. Except on an IPv6 network, anybody on IPv6 can hypothetically ping your IP address, assuming it's on the, the actual publicly routable side. Again, there are private IP ranges for IPv6 that aren't uh, that are explicitly not routable. Still, don't use those for now. Um, those are for very private network kind of things that you don't want to, to get routed. But it does mean that you like you know in the, in the case of your IoT device, as I, I, I've got illustrated here, the the big bad internet does. If you've got IPv6, may actually have direct access to your IoT device, and because we all know that IoT devices are totally and absolutely and miraculously perfectly secure, you know, nothing will ever bad or nothing bad will ever happen to to that poor, poor little IoT device, right? Um, this does mean that you have to be a bit more diligent and a bit more careful on how you you write your firewall rules, but it also means that you can actually think about your devices partic um, in a much more uniform way. In fact, because we have NAT, a lot of devices on your, even on your own home network probably, do weird and wacky things to specifically uh, uh, plow holes through the, the, the firewall, through the network address translation, to be able to, to get um, different connections going out. This makes it very hard to write some firewall rules uh, um, for things that uh, um, may be really complicated, may be really obnoxious. So. Um, IPv6 actually makes a lot of this simpler, but obviously, you know, while IPv6 is still rolling out, not everybody has it yet. It's not everywhere yet. We're still working on it. So, um, I obviously mentioned IPset earlier and how that actually delayed uh, um, some things in uh, uh, with NF tables coming out. Let's back up a little bit and let's talk about uh, NF tables and IPset. With NF tables, you actually don't need IP set anymore because NF tables actually has the same basic functionality already baked into it. And in fact, it goes a couple of steps further beyond um, beyond that in just the types uh, of dictionaries and the types of uh, um, uh, mappings that it can do inside of it. So IP, uh, IP set is very specific on how it can uh, do things. It's basically an IP address, sometimes with an expiration and, and a long list, and it's... Um, uh, um, to, to make it very efficient. NF tables actually gives you, you know, full maps, full, full dictionaries that you can use to actually build these complicated, uh, um, like, IP lists uh, uh, for doing things with. And they're already built into NF tables. So this is all there. Everything's already taken care of. You don't have to treat this as a separate piece to the rest of your firewall the way you would have to do this with IP set. Um, and quick example of this, um, I've got a, a block list here of IP addresses. I do not want uh, um, accessing uh, uh, anything on my network. We go ahead and set up uh, a block list. We give it that anything that gets added to that block list is uh, uh, times out after three hours and 45 seconds. So um, basically what that means is once an IP address is put in there, there's a timestamp. And once that timestamp, uh, um, or once that timer exhausts, um, it is actually removed from the list automatically. Um, the IP set has a very similar mechanism, um, but uh, uh, NF tables already obviously has this built in really, really well. Um, on top of that, the, the, the rule set off to the, the right here is, is really the, the, the next piece that, that would matter that, uh, um, and, and how you would actually reference that. So, um, and uh, uh, basically that's just a dump, that's NFT list rule set. That's exactly what the, the rest of the, the, the firewall was seeing. So, um, again, I talked very briefly about IP, uh, uh, translating IP tables to NF tables. Don't do it. Just If you want to do it as a, um, just to figure out how things work, how maybe some of this might actually work out, you can try it. It's probably not going to work the way you expect it. And one of the really you know simple examples of this, a bridged firewall, uh, an example bridge set up from IP tables, um, defines a bunch of pieces. And then after the translation, basically a lot of the pieces of that uh, um, bridge were explicitly commented out because there was no good way for NF or the, the, the translator to translate that back into something useful for NF tables because the concept doesn't exist the same way.
So, um, and obviously uh, this is intended as a tutorial class. This is an, an intended as uh, um, something that beginners can do. One of the things that people are going to ask for is obviously a GUI firewall builder. There are some that exist. They aren't, you know, there's not a lot. And sometimes these firewalls can get very complicated. Um, there's things like Fire, uh, uh, FW Builder and, um, in fact, Firewall D at this point, uh, in a lot of cases, is using uh, um, NF tables in the back end itself. So if you're using Firewall D, you might actually already have a decent uh, uh, GUI uh, system to, to build your firewall or at least get a, a, a starting point for a firewall. So, and last but not least, obviously, where do you find more documentation? Because um, NF Tables, unfortunately, has some really kind of terrible uh, uh, places to find documentation. Um, this is my, my, my best suggestion on where to go look. Take a look at the NF Tables wiki, um, which is listed there. Arch Linux has a very good NF Tables uh, uh, page on their wiki. There is a book. Um, that was published in 2015. It's not too bad. Um, go ahead and take a look at that. And obviously there's always the NFT manual page. Um, again, so I, I'm running out of time at this point and uh, I don't want to run over too far here. Um, again, my name is John Hawley. Uh, I, I work at VMware as one of their open source engineers. I can be found online, um, usually as Warthog9. Um, pretty much if you Google for Warthog9, you'll, you'll almost certainly find me. Um, if you need to get a hold of me on Twitter, at Warty9. Uh, if you need to email me, Warthog9 at eagleskrag.net, or you can use my work email, jhawley at vmware.com. Um, take your pick. Go, please go ahead and reach out to me. And um, I, I, I hope this was uh, uh, beneficial. I hope this was useful. And I really do hope that uh, at some point we can go back to uh, doing this in person and actually being able to work through some of these things more individually and in a, in a better setting than recording a webcast. So anyway, thank you very much. And now for your jarring transition to my office. Um, the, uh, again, I hope this was useful. Um, there's been some questions that I've been keeping back, um, that I haven't been answering. Um, I'm probably going to repeat some of the questions that I did answer just so that, um, some of this gets recorded, but, uh, um, um, one of the, the, several of you have asked specifically what the, the performance looks like between IP tables and NF tables. So as I mentioned in a lot of newer kernels, IP tables is, or IP6 tables is using uh, um, BPF uh, hidden away in the back end um, for its packet filtering, which is also what NF tables is using. So, f f you know, conceptually, they're about the same performance. However, there are concepts that, um, that are uh, dramatically faster inside of NF tables than they are in IP tables. So things like if you use a native IP table or uh, yeah, IP tables list. So if you've got like a, a block list or something and you, you've put it directly into NF or into IP tables, um, that is going to be dramatically slower than a similar implementation in NF tables, just because NF tables represents that list completely differently than IP tables will. Um, and I don't think there's any major optimization pieces inside of IP tables when it's using BPF to, to try and make it faster. I think it's just, it's literally just taking the rule set and, and doing a translation to BPF. Um, the uh, uh, slides are actually up already. Um, I uploaded them about five minutes ago. So um, if you want to go and grab those examples and play with those, uh, um, they're already up. They're already available. You should be able to go grab them. If you have problems getting at them, let me know. Uh, however, you, you want to get a hold of me, I'm on the the OSS and uh, the OSS ELC um, Slack uh, right now. Um, and obviously, you can you know Twitter me or or um, email me, and I'll I'll I can you know get you the the more text copies of those examples instead of just the the stuff inside the the PowerPoint slides. Um, there was a question about uh, um, port 67 being used for DHCP. Yes, um, DHCP does use uh, uh, UDP port 67 um, for some, uh, for its communication. So if you're using DHCP on your network and you want to um, specifically uh, um, make sure that that's allowed, 
something to be aware of and to add to your firewall rules. Um, do, 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 let's see. Uh, yes, <laughs> um, there was a comment, uh, a question about how um, NAT has uh, uh, some very large issues. NAT, you know, if it wasn't obvious from my, my commentary, NAT uh, uh, is useful for extending the life of IPv4 uh, um, beyond its fundamentally usable state. Uh, um, we're at the point where there are, are places doing multi-level NAT and Oh my gosh, it causes so many problems. It's kind of mind boggling, but it's getting us through the, the transition period for getting to IPv6. The downside is, is that because everyone's kind of gotten used to this idea of NAT existing, a lot of people don't under, have kind of lost track of that the internet is not supposed to be this weird, uh, um, semi bifurcated, uh, uh, system that the internet is actually supposed to be a very flat topology. And the, um, so when people start looking at firewalls or, or, or new routers or whatnot, they, they keep wanting or looking at, at trying to think of, you know, IPv6 with NAT when they shouldn't be. They, they, they should be, uh, um, looking at IPv6 as the, the, the internet going back to a fully flat state. Um, in fact, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could ping my laptop's IPv6 address and it would go directly to my laptop. It does pass through my firewall at home and uh, um, I, I do explicitly allow that because I, I don't I don't think there's any significant issue whether you know if my laptop is on my home network or not. But I mean, there are there is rhyme and reason why people have to kind of think about their 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 devices and their firewall topology is a little bit different. Um, uh, are the pre-recorded videos going to be available? So the um, so this video is going to be available, as I understand it, for a year inside of this system, um, and then it's going to transi transition to YouTube after a year. Don't quote me on this, but as I understand it, after um, the conference, you'll be able to sign up for this system and get at them without uh, the entrance fee. Again, don't quote me on that. I, this is what I, I have heard. Um, but if it really becomes an issue and you really need the videos, I do still ha obviously have copies of the videos. Um, ping me and we'll, we'll talk about uh, um, getting you access to those. I just don't want to necessarily uh, make those super available um, quite yet. Uh, let's see. What other questions are going on here? Um, so there were there uh, um, question on can we do the same thing using NF tables as with IP tables such as packet marking and redirecting and forwarding and whatnot? Yes, the, the, the NF tables fund for the most part hasn't actually taken away any of those kinds of features. They've just centralized them into a, a single location inside the Linux kernel where where this all happens. Um, there are a few concepts here and there that don't really translate well. NF tables has a tendency to have a roughly equivalent idea, but it may not be done exactly the same way. So um, let's see some more questions on performance, but I already kind of did that. Um, yes, NF tables and IP tables are completely separate subsystems inside uh, the Linux kernel. If you're running them both at the same time, when things get processed, or you know, when a packet gets processed and in what order gets a little weird, that's why uh, um, I would suggest turning it off um, or, or turning off uh, uh, IP tables slash IP6 tables if you're going to play with NF tables. Um, that state isn't exactly well defined, and I don't think the the, the networking guys. Are, are, uh, really intend for this ever to be run at the same time the same way. Um, let's see. Do I have any resources to help someone who's a new sysadmin? So the best I, I I can point you to is the the resources I have at the the end of the the presentation. Like I said, NF tables documentation is a little on the lacking side, and that's part of the reason I wanted to do this talk. That's why I've done it a couple of times. Is I want to get at least some basic more more of the basic information out there um so that people can start building on that a lot of the 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 people who have been playing with nf tables for the most part um are the ones who are willing to you know to dig through that the the the, the documentations that's there and to ask questions and play with things 
and sometimes you know we we'll get this stuff all working for ourselves and then we forget to actually tell people so i'm trying to to make sure that i i, I get that missing piece of telling people um back out so uh let's see Okay, so the, the what policy will be applied to a packet if no table matches or applies a policy in uh, in them. Um, so if you saw, I, I, and I, uh, again, the I apologize, some of the encoding uh, um, uh, uh, might have made it a little bit hard, and I'll also apologize for some of the background noise. Welcome to uh, uh, um, doing conferences with toddlers. Um, the uh, um, there is a, a default policy for for the table. Uh, um, so if, if something doesn't get you know matched, there is a, a generic overall table that uh, um, there is a policy associated with which will will match. For the most part, if you're building your own uh, uh, firewall, that policy probably is to drop. So you're, you're probably going to end up dropping things on the floor. Um, I am not aware if they have actually fixed the... So the question is, is did they finally solve the 16.7 million rule problem um, uh, with lots of Kubernetes pods? I don't know. I didn't actually know that that existed. And um, uh, ping me on Twitter, and I, I may go poke a couple of people just to ask. Um, I can understand why um, there would be like a 16 million rule limit, but I can also understand why uh, um, our systems have gotten so much more complicated that that might need to change and be fixed. Um, let's see. Can NF tables and Ansible be integrated? Yes! So if you uh, um, were in my talk earlier about Ansible, I actually mentioned an SSH module that I've got up on my GitHub, so uh, github.com slash warthog9. Um, Probably the the most recent uh, um, uh, repository I've got out there for uh, for doing SSH does in fact show how I or sort of show how I'm using uh, um, NF tables in some of my own Ansible modules. So I I, I actually the the example has an SSH uh, um, some SSH pieces for for setting up different ports. Uh, that you're going to run SSH on, and and so that's how I've been integrating it. Um, there are probably a million different ways that you could integrate it. That's the way I'm going uh, um, with my Ansible integrations. If I find a better way, I'll probably table flip and, and switch over to it. Um, but uh, yes, they, they can, in fact, uh, um, be integrated. Uh, let's see. Are there any clear advantages of NF tables over IP slash IP6 tables? Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> the, at the very least, at the very least, um, having your IP or your IPv4 and your IPv6 um, firewalling in one place makes everything so much easier to deal with because you can actually see what the interaction should look like instead of having to mentally keep track of two completely separate firewalls. Now, if you're doing that with, with a, a dual home setup, you're probably logically having to keep track of... Um, uh, different uh, uh, rule sets anyway, which is slightly unfortunate, but at least, you know, if you're trying to open a port for, uh, um, you know, some service that's on your network, I, 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 it almost doesn't even matter, you know, port 80 to to some web server that's be, that's on your network. Um, you can at least put the rule right next to each other so that it's really obvious that, you know, for IPv6, you've got this, or IP uh, and IPv4, you've got this. Um and frankly, that 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 that's a huge, huge win. And particularly if you have very complicated um, firewalls. The um, I've got uh, uh, another talk I've done before um, uh, discussing home firewalls. Um, there's even a blog post up on the open source uh, VMware open source blog um, about the the firewall I actually run for my house which is ridiculously complicated for a home firewall. I think I'm up to, I think right now I'm up to 12 VLANs and different interactions across VLANs for a variety of reasons. Um, and having to maintain this for IPv4 and IPv6 is really, really complicated. In fact, I, I actually kind of gave up and only small subsections of my internal network have IPv6 because I, I just didn't want to recreate the effort. 
um, and my firewall currently is still, uh, um, at least in my house, is still IPv, IP tables slash IP6 tables. Uh, um, now, once, you know, I'm literally in the middle of rebuilding it, I'm probably going to use NF tables raw, uh, um, kind of how the, the presentation here is done. Um, once I've done that, it actually should be a lot easier to maintain, um, and the rule sets, um, will be much more obvious and much, much easier to, to deal with going forward. So I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to that. Um, and having those rule sets actually be effectively in sync, because if I'm, you know, already in to change something for IPv4, in fact, a lot of the times it's, I don't even need to do anything different for the rule set to make it work for IPv6. So I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to, to that as a, a um, as a clear advantage of, um, Switching over from IBB, uh, uh, IB tables to to NF tables, um, and obviously, I mean, NF tables has some a- a advantages from like block lists, where their their internal representation of um, lists and uh, um, such is way better. I mean, you can kind of work around this uh, with IP set, but having it native in IP tables is um, just means there's one less you know logical piece to 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 really. Uh, um, keep in your head. It's all just NF tables instead of IP tables and IP6 tables and IP set and, 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 um, so, and I, th- oh, I got some more questions popped up. Let's see. Can I use NF tables for Geneva overlay? I'm not sure. To be fair, I'm not even sure what, uh, um, uh, um, Geneva would refer to outside of um, some of the infotainment stuff. Um, if you're interested in picking my brain more on that, track me down after the talk, and I'll try and get you a better answer than that. Otherwise, I think I'm winding down on questions, and um, I don't want to take up too much time because we're going to um, run into the next sessions here pretty quick. So um, thank you very much for attending. Um, obviously, again, if you've got more questions, track me down. I'm I'm happy to talk on this stuff. So thank you.